Good morning, everybody. I'm Kate Seeley with the Middle East Institute, and I'd like to welcome you to today's event, Stolen Heritage, Cultural Racketeering in Egypt with Deborah Lair. Uh, Deborah has been leading a coalition of archaeological, uh, cultural heritage, and business organizations uh, that are devoted, have come together to protect archaeological sites and cultural artifacts in Egypt. Uh, they've brought much needed attention to an issue of growing concern in Egypt and internationally, and that is the increased looting of Egypt's cultural heritage. Basically due to Egypt's declining security situation since 2011, uh, looters and traffickers have, have taken advantage of the situation to steal from Egypt's sites and museum an estimated amount worth tens of millions of dollars of, of artifacts and antiquities. It's, uh, it's really a tragedy. As Egypt's Minister of Antiquities recently wrote in a very eloquent op-ed in the Washington Post, Egypt's history holds the prosperity of the country's future generations, including that of its youth. Unfortunately, this growing cultural uh, racketeering crisis is depriving Egyptians of this uh, cultural, historic, and economic um, opportunity that they derive from this amazing history of theirs. Thankfully, uh, Deborah, and her colleagues from the American Schools of Oriental Research, the Archaeological Institute of America, the National uh, Geographic Society, and others have come together to form the International Coalition to Protect Egyptians, uh, Egyptian Antiquities. Uh, they're working not only to raise awareness about this uh, crisis uh, here and abroad, but they're working to um, create policies that will make it harder to traffic Egyptian antiquities. Uh, today, we'll be hearing more about the scope and scale of this crisis, as well as areas areas in which the International Coalition is working to combat the problem uh, and the work that they're doing with the Ministry of Antiquities uh, to fight together uh, against this, uh, this ongoing theft. And then we'll, we'll open the floor to questions. I just want to add that taking on a challenge of this scale and scope requires a very savvy, hardworking, passionate leader, and that uh, describes Deborah, uh, who has been uh, really at the forefront of this issue. She is currently uh, the chairman of the Antiquities Coalition, which is uh, shining a spotlight on these problems. It's the umbrella organization for the international uh, coalition that I mentioned earlier. Um, the, the Antiquities Coalition is part of the Capital Archaeological Institute, which she is working with at GW. And she is vice chairman of the Paulson Institute. She wears another hat where she works on China. But this is, this is, uh, this must be taking a lot of your time, Deborah. She also serves on a number of international and U.S.-based advisory boards, including the Elliott School at GW and the Archaeological Institute of America. And we're so delighted and honored that she's here today to tell us more about um, this problem. What we can all do to stop it. Okay, thank you so much for that. A uh, very warm welcome. And Wendy, thank you for hosting me here today. We're really delighted that the Middle East Institute has decided to highlight this issue, uh, as we think it's so important. And I appreciate all of you coming on this beautiful, sunny day to hear about what's happening in Egypt. And clearly, there's a crisis unfolding. And I know most of you probably think of that in the political context, but there's a cultural crisis as well. And some of the world's most precious archaeological sites and artifacts are being senselessly looted. And this is not an issue that is just unique to Egypt. Looting or cultural racketeering is a crime of global proportions. In fact, the FBI says that it's one of the top five global international crimes. But unlike other illicit trades, there's not a coordinated global effort to try and combat it. Few people even talk about it. It's often viewed as a victimless crime but it's reached crisis proportions in Egypt. Now, obviously, Egypt's going through a rocky transition to democracy. And the first priorities really need to be to focus on the economy and on electing a new government. But the ongoing turmoil has really been tragic for the preservation of the country's priceless cultural heritage. And robbing Egypt's past, as Kate was saying, also puts at risk its economic recovery. So our story is really like an Indiana Jones movie, or as we might say, an Indiana Janes, since it tends to be women who are at the forefront of leading this effort. We have uh, Monica Hanna, the wonderful Egyptian who was here two weeks ago, who has been leading the effort with some of her female colleagues. Dr. Sarah Parkek, who is an Egyptian 
I'm sorry, who is an Egyptologist, but she also is known as the space archaeologist who does the satellite imagery that's been tracking a lot of looting. And we have also Katie Paul, who has been part of our coalition since she was a graduate student and has been doing some of the fundamental underlying research around our work. We have the beautiful heroines, we have the bad guys, we have supporters, we have terrorists, we even have unlikely allies in the Egyptian and Israeli governments who've been working together and trying to stop this trade. Obviously, the reality is a lot more complicated, but the story starts with the revolution in January 2011. And you may remember the moving photos of the Egyptians at that time uh, joining hands to form a human shield around the Egyptian museum. But at the same time that this was going on, calls were going out through the mosques at archaeological sites like Saqqara and Abu Sir to go out and loot. And very soon, this unorganized mass looting turned into systematic and organized looting. In response to these reports of looting flooding over the archaeological hotlines, our group came together, made up, as Kate was saying, of representatives from a variety of different backgrounds, of academic institutions, former government officials, explorers, investigators, and learned societies. Our intent was to try and bring our collective experience with these varied backgrounds to volunteer our support for Egypt. And as a result, the Egyptian government invited us to Cairo in May 2011 to start negotiations about how we could help. And I just want to state one thing in recognizing the obvious. Looting has been going on for thousands of years. We recognize that. And it's very difficult to stop looting during difficult economic times. But that said, what we're talking about is something very different. We're focused on cultural racketeering, which is the systematic and organized theft of antiquities. And it's being done on a global basis. You can see these very proud Egyptian policemen who made a seizure in Giza. In one home, they found over 1,000 illegally obtained objects through illicit digging. And the estimates were in the um, hundreds of millions of dollars for what these items, just this one seizure, were worth. So in distinguishing between uh, the looting that just happens in the back, as I said, in the backyards and people just running out and digging and what's been going on for thousands of years, we have come up with this term of cultural racketeering to try and help people better understand what it is we're trying to fight against. And I just want to make a few points then about this issue. One, cultural racketeering is happening on a massive scale. I know that there are some archaeologists here in the audience, but for those of you who are on, this is um, a dig in Israel by the head of our institute, Dr. Eric Klein, who was our, my partner in launching this whole initiative. And you can see how regular and systematic their digging is. And everything is recorded precisely with photographs. This is what's happening with the illegal digging going on. And here, you can see clearly, random holes springing up like Swiss cheese all over these sites. This is one in Abu Sir, not far from Cairo. Our research has shown that the increase, first, every major archaeological site has been subject to some form of looting in Egypt. And our research has shown that for the majority of them, the increase has been between 500 and 1,000 percent. And the looting is also very organized and systematic. Here are some of the satellite imagery that you can see with the extension that we used that Sarah Parkek did for us. This is in Abyssir, obviously, before the revolution. This is one month after those rev the revolution. You could see before the looter pits, when we were walking on the ground, this is what they look like from space, randomly spaced out looking for treasure beneath the sand. 2011, you can see it's expanded all through there. And what they have done in the meantime is gone in with bulldozers into these sites to clear it out. Um, and destroying anything that was found there beneath the sand in any kind of context to start to build a modern cemetery. In Dasher, you can see the same thing. Here we start in those rectangular objects that you see are areas where they think that they're, for these satellite imagery, there are structures underneath. You can see the expansion, 2012, 2013. It's pretty astonishing how quickly it's increased at these sites, and this is all over. As I said, it's organized and systematic. This isn't just people going out with shovels. This is moving in major construction equipment to start digging beneath the sand. And just imagine the, the 
the destruction that's taking place in terms of the context and what is destroyed where they're looking for treasure. In some cities, it's better than others. In Luxor, there's the, the uh, local people recognize very clearly that their livelihoods are dependent on the archaeological um, tourist trade. And so they've been more vigilant in protecting the sites, although some storerooms have been broken into just this week and two major statues stolen from them. In El Hiba, which we saw some of the other sites, and you'll see some more in this later, just armed gangs moving in with mass looting going on. This is a, a truck they found that was waiting to carry away the day's uh, treasures that were found. This is one of the looted tombs. Um, this is a very dangerous yet profitable business. As you can see, the entrance to the tombs are very small. And so what a lot of the looters do is send in young children to see what they can find inside. And there have been numerous reports, because this is just illegal digging, they're not going in ensuring that the structures are sound. A number of them have collapsed when the children have been inside and reports of these children dying because of these um, burials, you know, because of it collapsing. They're dangerous to protect as well. The people who are tasked with protecting the sites are not armed. The gangs clearly are. And the distribution of these illicit or stolen antiquities is often conducted by criminal networks who are involved in other types of crimes. It's not just the antiquities crimes. The people who've set up these distribution networks tend to be the same people who are trafficking in guns and drugs and in humans. There's also terrorist involvement. Uh, we've seen it in Egypt. We've seen it in a number of the other countries that we've been tracking around the world. It's a very profitable trade. And it's a lot easier to smuggle an ancient pot than it is to smuggle drugs or humans. The response to the looting at a local level has been very interesting. And just like with the political revolution, we've seen that it's the youth who have been organizing, using social media to try and protect these sites and to highlight the damage that's been going on. Monica Hanna, who was in the US two weeks ago, and you may have seen a story about her in the New York Times, has been one of the leaders in organizing the Egypt Heritage Task Force, where they use Twitter when they hear reports of looting to get young people to go out and try and protect the sites, and they take photographs of the damage that's been done and place it on Facebook. It's been a great way in raising the profile. And the looters have been successful in finding items. As we have gone through and ground truthed in some of these areas, we've seen the destruction that they left behind from what they found. This is an example of mummies that they have found in El Hiba, where they go and they unwrap them looking for the treasures that are buried beneath the various layers of the wrapping. And they leave then the scraps and the bones just scattered all over. Another one from El Hiba. Wooden fragments of a sarcophagus that we found in Abu Sir as we walked through. Again, this is one of the inspectors showing us the sites and various other fragments, mummy limbs left. It's really very sad, not only for the treatment of these antiquities, but for the context that is lost in the process. This is an example. They're using sophisticated tools. They're dynamiting in one of the Christian sites to try and break down the tombs and get some of the massive carvings to be able to sell overseas. This is in one of the mosques where they're prying out some of the intricate carvings to sell. And we've seen some of these items to start to appear in the international markets. And the Malawi Museum you may have read about. This is one of the before photos. And this is the after photos. And members of the Muslim Brotherhood went in and ransacked the museum, followed by some youth who were going in and looting. And not only did they steal the majority of items, but the ones that were left, they burned. And they've been breaking into a number of the storage facilities. As you can see, they're not very sophisticated. The government has been trying to buy more sophisticated ones, but it's a million dollars per storage magazine. And they have about 40 of them, each one which holds about 100,000 items. So in the meantime, they've been using the old ones, which have been clearly subject to um, random looting. All it takes really is to go clip off the padlock on some of them. But there's been mass loss of these items, which is really a shame, since in many cases, there's no national inventory. So we don't know what's been lost. 
And some of the sites now are just becoming dumps. So the other issue that's clear is we're starting to see in the international markets is there's a flood of antiquities coming out from Egypt. And these antiquities are garnering huge prices. These are examples. I'm not saying that these are illegal or looted. But these are just examples from the sales this summer so you can see what the pricing is. It's astonishing. Even the small statue, which is only a few inches high, was $40,000. And we have one of the heroes here who has been working, Hani Nagi, from the Egyptian embassy, who's been working to try and retrieve the Egyptian antiquities, working with, very successfully with eBay. And eBay actually has been one of the most responsive, because after a very strong petition from the Egyptian government that they were selling looted items on their site, they actually took down over 200 items and now are devising mechanisms to work with the Egyptians to make sure that anything that goes up on the site is actually legitimate. Some of the other auction houses have been a little more challenging. Christie's was having a sale this past summer both in the UK and in the US. In the UK, when the Egyptian government protested, they withdrew a number of the items. It turned out that they were looted and arrests were made of the people trying to sell them. In the United States, the attitude was essentially prove it. And when they were given materials to show that a number of these items were looted, they still went ahead with the sale. Fortunately, since that time, they have been a little more responsive in trying to develop methods to work with the Egyptian government in verifying these, but it's a real challenge. Sotheby's has yet to engage. But the real concern in all of this, and this is not to say that we're trying to stop in any way the legitimate trade of these items. It's only the illegitimate trade, and it's much more difficult to start to get at when the money is this high, there's such huge demand, and a lot of this is going into private collections. One of the big challenges that we've had in this process is coming up with realistic numbers on the costs of cultural racketeering. And there are several kinds of economic impact to consider. One is clearly what the impact is on cultural terrorism, I mean tourism. Uh, obviously, the security situation in Egypt has made, has you know, put a real damper on tourists traveling. And the tourism minister just uh, announced that last year was the worst in modern history for tourism, 2013. At the Ministry of Antiquities, most of their budget is dependent on revenues coming in from the museums and visitors to the archaeological sites, and their revenues are down by 90%. So at the time that they're facing their largest challenge in protecting their sites, they're doing it with a real lack of financial resources. Minister Ibrahim, the current minister, is, I think, doing the best that he can under these circumstances. He's been thinking very creatively about what the Egyptian government can be doing and how they can be reaching out to other international institutions and organizations to help them in this process. Uh, the constant transition of governments has also been a big challenge. Just this minister has been appointed, fired, and reappointed four times. So it does make for a little bit of a challenge in having a consistent policy in addressing these. But he gets a lot of credit for raising the profile on the issue and making use that the, of the resources and organizations like yours who are willing to raise the profile on this issue to at least bring awareness to the issue and try and increase security at these sites. The other issue that we've really looked at, and this is a challenge I think within the archaeological community, is coming up with what the numbers are from this illicit digging. Based on the extent of, based on our satellite imagery and research at the Antiquities Coalition, tracking the satellite imagery, the, progress, the progression of the looting, and what we know can be found in these areas and for the sales on the local markets, we have a very conservative estimate mm -hmm. of what we think the amount of looting has been in Egypt. And we would say since the revolution in 2011, it's probably around $3 billion. Many think it's much higher than that, closer to $10 million. So if you think back to what I was saying with the FBI as one of the top crimes, they have a number of six billion. We think that that is woefully inadequate. So I said, one of the top five global crimes, they think. Six billion on a global basis, but this number was developed over 10 years ago. So with Egypt, we know it's at probably three to 10 billion. Globally, it has to be a much more significant number. 
The United Nations has called this illicit trade uh, one of the most persistent illegal trades in the world. Their estimates back in 1999 that the costs were almost $8 billion. Just behind drugs and guns is the most profitable uh, black market. So with Egypt, if we say on average that it would be $6 billion, we know coming out of Syria it's $2 billion. If you start to add in the other countries, Cambodia, Syria, Libya, China, the global numbers are going to be much, much higher. Some would estimate into the hundreds of billions, I think probably much more realistic in the tens of billions. But this is one area that needs a lot of research, and the RAND Corporation fortunately has been willing to take on some of this um, research because it is such a challenging issue with very little focus on it. Now, logically, in times of crisis with the breakdown in civil society, we know that looting increases. And I was saying, we've seen this so clearly in Egypt. We saw similar patterns in Iraq and Afghanistan. We're seeing them in um, Syria, Libya. Even with uh, the breakdown and the economic times in Greece, we've seen it. Portugal, China, for a whole other reason, but the numbers are rapidly increasing. And there's demand for many of these antiquities by collectors in the first world markets. The second issue, as I was talking about earlier, is who is doing the trading in this? And by and large, it's these uh, organizations who were involved in other mm -hmm. kinds of illicit trade. It's not just people smuggling antiquities. They're the ones who have the established networks who are running uh, humans through them, they're running guns, they're running drugs. And there are terrorist networks. Uh, we have very clear evidence Syria's opposition has archaeological gangs that when they need funding for weapons, they go out and loot, ar loot archaeological sites and sell them in the international markets. Research done by Tess Davis at the University of Glasgow, which is doing the leading research on trafficking and culture, has a clear linkage between the Khmer Rouge and um, the, who were trading antiquities for cash at the height of the Civil War in Cambodia. And in China, we have seen an increase in looting as a byproduct of the rapid rush for um, development and growth. And the triads have been involved in looting a number of these sites. They're smuggling them out through Hong Kong, which then are showing up on Hollywood Road there. In Egypt, a lot of the items are being smuggled out through the cyanides, one of the reasons we're seeing such close cooperation between Israel and Egypt, and also many through diplomatic pouches to other parts of the world, including the Middle East. Switzerland and Israel are considered as consolidation centers for this type of trade, for distribution then on to Europe and the United States, Japan, and other parts of the Middle East. Um, as I said, Israel has been particularly focused on this, and they've seized hundreds and hundreds of antiquities. The little bit of a challenge is over the three years, they haven't returned any of them yet, but they have been very, very vigilant in seizing them. And with, as was true with many of these black crimes, the trade tends to be from the have-nots to the haves, with the bulk of the financial gain going to the middlemen. The United Nations estimates that from the point of the illegal excavation to the point of sale, the item's value increases by over 100%, and 98% of that is going to the middleman. So even these local people who are looting are not benefiting from the financial gains of the eventual sale. So as a global problem, we strongly believe that there needs to be a global solution. And a solution requires a comprehensive approach led by major institutions, including governments, but organizations like the United Nations. They need to focus on this in developing a global solution because it's not a local issue. There are many, many dedicated people in the cultural heritage field, I know that there are some in this room today, who are often risking their lives at the grassroots levels, fighting against these illicit criminals, or these criminal networks, uh, to protect the sites and raise awareness. And, but, and clearly, domestic governments need to bear the largest burden of all of this in implementing policies at a local level and dedicating the resources to protect these sites. But in times of crisis, they really need help. In the case of Egypt, they definitely need to continue to increase security at the sites. But as I said with Minister Ibrahim and his revenues going down, it's they have to be creative in how they use their limited resources, particularly when often the security services are pulled off to address other more pressing issues. 
and they have been creative in working through the embassies. The Egyptian embassy here has played a very active and very aggressive role. Hani Nagy, but his colleague Yasser El Nagar, the DCM, have taken on this issue. We were first introduced to them when uh, he had to fill in in his first month for the ambassador and coming to the launch of our institute. And they have been dedicated supporters to this cause since that time. And we really appreciate all of your support. They've worked tirelessly with the archaeological community, with the auction houses. As I said, Hani had a great success with eBay and with other governments to try and garner support and raise awareness of the issue. Our organization is calling on a few, uh, is, is doing quite a few things to try and address this issue, but there are three that I'd really like to highlight for you today. One is there's a real need to update the global legal framework for dealing with cultural racketeering. There's no one single organization who has been willing or able to go in and work with these countries in their time of need. UNESCO and the other organizations only come in truly after the fact. And the UNESCO Convention which on um, Global Trafficking, which was the first of its kind to actually address heritage, was groundbreaking. But it was groundbreaking back in 1970. So it's in desperate need of being updated to address the modern realities. The second issue that we are calling for is a leadership role by the United States government. Helping to save other countries' heritage can be an important diplomatic tool. I'm sure most of you saw Monuments Men and you saw the important role that the Monuments Men played in the recovery of art, but mainly in the support and showing the appreciation for others' culture. The US, if I could say it to this group, needs a few positives in the US-Egypt relationship and with several of these other countries. Even if it's just to create leverage that you can trade away again at a later point. So one of the things that we would like to see is to have culture part of the regular strategic dialogues that the United States has with countries like Egypt. As uh, Kate said earlier, I work on China and I was working with Hank Paulson when he was Secretary of Treasury in the creation and the launch of the Strategic Economic Dialogue. That has been expanded on China to include culture. We'd like to see archaeology be more active, but to great benefit. It's become a thriving part of the US-China dialogue between the governments. We think that would be a very logical thing to be doing with the Middle East. And to see state take a much more proactive stance in negotiating cultural heritage MOUs. Now, I realize that sometimes these are very controversial, but it's one of the few areas that the US government can actually play a positive role in helping on cultural heritage. I think there's a new Assistant Secretary, Evan Ryan, who's been doing a very good job. Egypt recently petitioned for emergency measures. When they're asking for emergency measures, it should not take a year or two to get them passed. The emergency means a true emergency. And the US government needs the ability consistent with the law to take action. And it shouldn't wait for countries to come ask for it, but instead it should be working proactively, particularly in situations where the countries may be involved in a crisis themselves and can't afford to have their negotiators flying back and forth for years to try and proactively put these in place. And all we're talking about in this context is stopping the illegal trade, not the legitimate trade of art and antiquities. We also would like to see state use its convening power to bring together interested parties to start a global discussion on this, bring together the governments involved, both from the haves and the have-nots, essentially, from the ones who have the archaeological sites that are being looted to the ones where the demand is the highest, and bring in the other institutions to start to explore potential solutions, and to dedicate funding in the aid packages to cultural heritage. Many of the types of things that we're talking about only have archaeology at their core, but they're really economic issues. Even simple things like building walls around the archaeological sites can have a positive impact. It's job creation locally, and it helps to protect the site. Finally, we think there's an important role for public-private partnerships. We'd like to see many of those who have profited off of heritage to also be using their resources to give back. We may be a little biased. We've signed uh, last month 
a public-private partnership with the Egyptian government to start to work on these very types of issues. But we think there's a very important role that the NGOs and the private sector can play in simple things like getting inventory started. You need to know what you have in order to know what's been stolen. Uh, doing emergency prepa uh, preparedness plans for cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. We can see what the patterns of looting are. We know when it's coming. If you work with the governments in advance and how to prepare for this, they're much more prepared when the crisis hits. Capacity building, always capacity building, but training and awareness, whether it's training the customs and how to recognize these uh, products that have been looted, or if it's just working with young archaeologists, training them to be archivists or how to be inspectors. Education and social entrepreneurship. We have a major focus in working to build up vested business interests around these archaeological sites to ensure that they're also devoted to their protection. So we really appreciate the Middle East Institute as one of the leading think tanks in this area, allowing us to come talk a little bit about what we think is really one of these most important issues that's facing us. Uh, it's one of these top global crimes, and we appreciate your leadership on this. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Deborah. Really hats off to you and the coalition for doing this incredible work and raising awareness. It's such an important topic. Um, as you said, it's really going to take a global effort. Everybody needs to be involved, governments, non-governmental organizations, and local communities. Yes. And I guess I want to start the conversation with this issue of local communities. And what can be done to get local communities more invested in uh, preserving and fighting and, uh, you know, uh, warding off uh, looters. Is, is there anything more that can be done? I know you mentioned Luxor um, mm -hmm. is, has been very good at mm -hmm. protecting its sites, but other sites, other areas where, you know, tourism is less of a factor. Um, is that part of the, the work you're doing or the recommendations you're making? And, and, and if so, what are they? Yes, it's definitely part of the recommendations. We've been looking at a number of different options, and, and we've been studying the examples that a lot of our colleagues in the conservation world have been doing. And something that's been very successful in conservation has been organized by a group called RARE. And for those of you who don't know, what they do is they have campaigns that they call pride campaigns. And they go into an area, say they would go into an area like Luxor, and they find local champions. And they provide them with the resources and the training to build awareness in the community about why protecting this particular, in the case of rare, it might be the black neck swan in China. In this case, why protecting the site is so important for the community. And they've had tremendous success. And so we are going to be testing out that kind of model. But we've also been partnering with organizations and programs like the 10,000 Women from Goldman Sachs. And what it is is a training program for women around the world who are entrepreneurs. And seeing if we can't create an entrepreneur spirit around some of these sites to create a local, as I was saying, vested business interest in their protection. And then working with organizations like Monica Hanna and others who are on the ground mm. to provide them with the kind of capacity building and support that they need to be successful. Because ultimately, this isn't about us coming in to solve Egypt's problem. This is about us helping to provide them with the tools and resources necessary for them to solve the problem. It have to be invested in this. Thank yes. you. Exactly. Um, questions? Barbara. Yeah. Sure. I'm Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council. And forgive me, I was okay. detained, so I may have missed okay. the answers to these questions. Uh, Egypt is experiencing a precipitous drop in tourism. So how do you convince people that it makes more sense to leave the artifacts where future tourists will come and not try to profit from it now, given that there aren't very many tourists coming? And if you could just repeat the estimates you gave of the uh, monetary uh, amount that's leaving Egypt and perhaps a few examples of artifacts that have been uh, seized uh, on their way out of Egypt. Thanks. Great. We're estimating, and, and that ultimately is one of the big challenges, and it's a combination of different issues. One is raising awareness, one is security, greater security at the sites, one is, and, and I think that's a bigger issue for Egypt overall, the improvement of the security situation. Hopefully, once the new government is in place and there's some 
sense of uh, stability, tourism will start to increase again, which will be beneficial to the archaeological sites, particularly since European and American tourists tend to go to visit the archaeological sites, not to visit the beaches. The um, estimates that we have of uh, what the cultural racketeering is costing Egypt is conservatively around $3 billion since the revolution, probably more realistically in the five to six billion dollar range. And if you like afterwards, we can show you a few slides and give you a few examples of some of the items that, that have been stolen. So Wendy Chamberlain from the Middle East Institute. Um, I was uh, uh, surprised and a little alarmed to hear your reference that the uh, mosques had actually, a call had gone out, did I hear this correctly? A call had gone out from the mosques to, to loot right after, uh, uh, in 2011. And then you, your later reference to the Muslim Brotherhood being a part of the racketeering, could you give us a little more background into that? <laughs> yes. Uh, we had Monica Hanna here, as I said, two weeks ago, and she was telling us at length about, uh, because we've been working in tandem, as she's been working on the ground there, we have been working internationally, uh, and some of our activities have been mirroring each other in the process, and that she was present at some of these sites, as were some of her colleagues at different sites, when the calls went out from the mosques to go out and loot, and that it was a reaction to the Mubarak regime who people had believed was profiting from the sales of certain antiquities. And there was a sense that if the elite of the Mubarak regime had profited, others should be able to as well. I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying this is what we were told and the evidence that we have that the calls were going out. And the Brotherhood? And the Brotherhood, we have reports and we know in the case of the Malawi Museum that it was members of the Brotherhood who raided the museum. And we have other examples that they have been targeting some of the museums and the storage units and participating in the illegal digging and selling these items in international markets. Why? Uh, to finance their cause. As I said, it's big money. Is it also because they think these are Artifacts are from a pre-Islamic and hence not such an important period? And that may also be, but they were involved in the bombing of the Islamic Museum. And there was a choice of where that bomb was, right? So when they bombed the police station, it totally destroyed the museum, the Islamic Museum. The irony of it. Yes, there's a question back here. Yeah, hi, my name is Peter yeah. Tomp. I'm an attorney uh, from the practice of Missouri. And I wanted to know your uh, thoughts on think that Egyptian um, government practices have any impact on looting? Do they ag actually potentially ex exacerbate the problem because uh, it causes people to associate antiquities with the government, and if they don't like the government, uh, they're going to either devalue the antiquities by destroying them or sell them and loot them? I just sort of want your thoughts on that. I don't see it necessarily as that the looting is going on as a reaction to the government, per se. It's, I think, a reaction to the economic and security situation. Question here. My name is Oise, engineering consultant, and with Towson University as well. Actually, I mean, you, you, you were focusing on one side of, of the whole story here. Who is benefiting at the end? Who is paying the money? And just personal experience, I've been to the Louvre in, in, in Paris at least a dozen times, okay? The whole floor is full of Egyptian stuff. And uh, I've been looking for the beautiful and precious uh, statue of the head of Queen Nefertari. And one of the attendants at the Louvre said, oh no, sir, it's in Berlin. I said, oh my God, I mean, how would I be there to look at? It happened a few months later. I've been in Berlin and I visited a full museum, two-story, all focused only on Nefertari. How did this artifact went to these big organizations? It's an organized, I should say, crime. And you, you don't have to look into those people who are digging and, and, and getting this out. No, who, where that... 
uh, anti-vax uh, artifacts, I mean, will end. And the famous, I have, sorry, just give me 30 seconds more. Uh, 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 archaeologist Zahi Hawass, Dr. Zahi Hawass, the world famous, he tried his best to get all these uh, antiquities back, and for some reason the man disappeared. I don't know, I mean, it's, it's, it's big world organized crime, I should say, at the end. Thank you. But thanks for your help yeah. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Hawass is in California. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to address his first point about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how, how can we handle it? the big organizations? Right. The loop has a full uh, uh, story, full of Egyptian artifacts. What about London? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> We're, we're starting with the more immediate issue of recently looted items, <laughs> that there are a lot of people who are focused on the whole repatriation issue. And I'm not sure that our value is as strong as the people like Dr. Hawass, who did an amazing job in raising the profile both on Egyptian antiquities, but, but raising the profile on this whole issue. And I know he brought together a number of countries to start to look at how you start to repre repatriate some of these major collections from museums in the UK, the US, Germany, and other places. But the man disappeared at the end. Maybe, Deborah, you could talk about one of the other challenges internally, which is getting a better handle on what exists in Egypt, registering the antiquities that are in the various museums. Um, they're not terribly well registered, and uh, there's a lot of stuff that's in museums that, you know, it's not on any list anywhere, and so as things okay. disappear, it's hard to know what's disappeared. So talk a little bit about those efforts that you're working on. Great, one of the things that we've agreed to do with the Egyptian government is to start a national registry, and nowhere was it more mm -hmm. apparent that the lack of having one was a problem was when the Malawi Museum was attacked, because there was no registrar to know what was what had been looted. So in order to start to raise awareness, what, what Monica and a number of other groups did is they appealed to scholars who had actually gone and studied or photographed there to get their photos. And they created a booklet then that they could share with Interpol and, and post on Facebook. And so it's very difficult in these situations if there's not a national registry to know what you've even lost. And so, we're looking and building on the efforts that Egypt had already made in doing the registry at the Cairo Museum, which took eight years to do. Uh, continue with the National Museum, and then start working on the storage units, and then we'll do the archaeological sites. So it's a multi-year task. It's a big endeavor, but it's something that's desperately needed. Be very invaluable. I, well, I have more questions. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So tell me a little bit when you said Egypt asked for emergency measures to be taken by the U.S. Can you describe that a little bit more? Were these like customs measures and you know, what can the U.S. do along those lines? And why did it take a year and what was the year that, that they took to do what exactly? Sure, I am, I am not, I know we have some people in the room here who are experts on the legal aspects of this, but there is, um, and maybe Mark, is this an area I think it, probably you know a lot too, but State is responsible for, for administering our domestic laws when it comes to cultural heritage, which are based on this 1970s convention. And countries can request negotiation of a cultural MOU to, if there's a problem, have state direct customs to impose restrictions on the import of agreed upon items coming from that country. And you can request emergency restrictions, just meaning that the process will move a little more quickly to get those restrictions in place at, while you negotiate this cultural MOU. And Peter, maybe you know what the average time is for negotiation of these agreements. I'm not it, it sure. It varies. It varies from, it varies from six months to uh, five years for the um, China MOU. Yeah. So these tend to take a very long time in their negotiation and on the uh, emergency restrictions, given that it is such a, an emergency essentially, and there's a very big package of information for criteria that the Egyptian has to, government has to meet when trying to meet these restrictions. One, proving that looting is going on, that's an easy one. Showing that they're actually addressing it, showing that um, that's not gonna, I think, have overly onerous um, 
restrictions on trade coming in and various other things that they have to meet. But we're hoping that a hearing has been called of the Cultural Property Advisory Committee for June 2nd and 3rd, and that's where they'll consider the Egyptian request, and hopefully mm -hmm. the committee will recommend positively that it, that it go into force. Good. Some, some potential uh, some hope there. <laughs> yes, some potential hope. Any, uh, any other questions or points? Uh, we've got uh, somebody here in the middle, yes? Marcella Schaefer, intern at the MEI. Um, you talked about how there are, you know, creating archives would be one way to keep track of what was lost. Is there any mechanisms for like um, museums and other countries outside of Egypt that can track whether something was stolen or not to ch check if they're suspicious of whether it was stolen? You mean if they find something, if somebody comes to sell something to them, is there a way to check it? Right. I mean, assuming that it's such a big international problem, it seems to me that they might want to forge and try and make it seem more legitimate than it is. Yeah, I think there's a lot of that that goes on, but there are opportunities. For example, when Christie's was going to make the sale, the Egyptian government actually provided um, exa uh, examples of what they thought were looted items and how these ones that were being sold at Christie's matched up to those. They didn't have exact pictures of the ones that were going because a lot of these are actually coming from illicit digging. But what they could show were at these sites where we know looting is going on, these similar types of items have been found and if you're allowed to inspect them, you can actually tell whether they've been recently um, excavated or not. Question here? Yes, uh, you mentioned that you're not against the legitimate trade. I guess my question is, um, one of the concerns that the legitimate trade has is that different types of artifacts have different types of provenance histories, and the ones that are of lesser value, like you know, like amulets and coins, things like that, will typically have much less documentation history as other things. I just want to get your thoughts on that, and if you think there should be a one-size-fits-all solution to what the provenance is, or should it vary according to the type of artifact? I think you're, um, Peter, getting a little beyond my area of expertise on that. Um, I find it a little um, ironic or maybe disturbing that Israelis are involved in this project um, because I understand they're digging around the Al-Aqsa Mosque and kind of throwing away Islamic artifacts and going, keeping the Roman artifacts. Um, I'd, and, and I'd like you to um, talk more about how they haven't exactly returned any of the items they intercepted in the Sinai. Why is Israel involved in this? Well, Israel is a major consolidation point, and so a lot of things are being smuggled out through the Sinai, they're brought together in Israel, and then they're shipped out to other parts of the world. Same with Switzerland. Those tend to be the two sites coming out of Egypt where the antiquities come out through there and then they are exported globally. So Israel actually has been very good about tracking what's coming out through the Sinai and seizing them, but to date, none of those antiquities have been returned to Egypt. Would, would the Egyptian government care to comment on that? <laughs> I am not going to speculate. <laughs> Well, for those of you who came late, I suggest you check out the Antiquities Coalition website. Deborah has some amazing uh, photos of looted sites and museums in Egypt. In fact, yes, there it is. So check it out and uh, keep following this very important issue. And please join me in thank you, thanking Deborah. Thank you. <laughs>